Hey guys, back with another video log and today I want to talk about branch chain amino acids and are they really a waste of money? Uh, so full disclosure, uh, I sold through my company Carbon a product called Recover which has branch chain amino acids in it. Now obviously uh, I felt that they would have a beneficial effect um, based on uh, some research and my experience using them and that's why I included them in the formula. However, some recent studies have come out uh, and suggested that branched chain amino acids uh, are not anabolic and do not have a muscle building effect and are not useful. So I want to discuss these. Uh, one of the first ones is a, is a new study from, uh, well, it's not a study, it's a review by uh, Bob Wolf. Bob Wolf is one of the preeminent uh, figures in muscle protein synthesis research and did a lot of the original research on essential amino acids. In fact, uh, several great professors have actually come from Bob Wolf's lab. So I want to emphasize that he's a very, very intelligent and well-respected professor um, in academia who studies this stuff. But a lot of people took his review where he basically said that BC BCAAs were not anabolic and didn't really read the entire thing. So BCAAs do increase muscle protein synthesis, which is an anabolic process, by definition, therefore anabolic. However, um, I think Bob's point he was trying to make in the paper is that BCAAs alone do not uh, maintain elevated muscle protein synthesis. The reason being that if you elevate muscle protein synthesis, but you don't have the other essential amino acids present, eventually what occurs is as the because to synthesize protein basically you have a ribosome that's translating an mrna and um, as it's translating that mrna it's adding amino acids to that uh to the to the growing peptide chain and if you have protein synthesis activated powerfully enough and there are not su sufficient uh essential amino acids of the other amino acids around to continue elongating that chain, um, protein synthesis essentially would short circuit, right? It's kind of like if you were trying to build a car and let's say uh, all of a sudden they ran out of uh, whatever transmissions, right, on the assembly line, the whole assembly line would stop because you need a transmission to build the car. So, uh, but the problem with this is that, yes, if you look at taking a BCA fasted, it doesn't sustain elevated rates of muscle protein synthesis for long. It's around an hour or two. And if you give a complete amino acid mixture or uh, just food, like whey protein, um, you get a much more prolonged response of muscle protein synthesis. In fact, that's one of the first studies I did was showing that a complete meal um, extends the duration of muscle protein synthesis compared to a purified solution of branched amino acids. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you're getting a mixture with all the essential amino acids in it. So why do I recommend branched chains and not essential amino acids? Well, most people aren't really fasted. Uh, you know, the fasting they do in lab is 12 to 16 hours. Uh, and most people are fasting for eight, maybe nine, 10 hours. Sure, if you get up in there, maybe, you know, you have an issue, but Let's say you even took a BCAA supplement in the morning before you were going to go train. Well, sure, you'd only get a response that lasts around an hour or two, but most people only train around an hour or two. So if you have whole food after that, you're still going to be fine. And then obviously, if you're taking BCAA throughout the day, um, you're eating throughout the day, so you're providing substrate. So you're, the idea that you're going to short circuit muscle protein synthesis, I, I, I think is pretty unlikely. Um, I, I, I totally understand Bob's point that you can't just take branched amino acids and, and, and grow muscle or get bigger because you need the other substrates. But I think people have taken kind of the paper a little bit out of context. But it, it is true, they are not muscle building inherently because you need the other essential amino acids. Now, why do I recommend BCAs versus essential amino acids? Well, because they have more leucine per gram, you get more anabolic bang for your buck. And for, like I said, for the most part, most people aren't fasted. Now, if you're fasting, if you fast for a long time, if you're somebody like, for example, doing intermittent fasting or something like that, 
then maybe essential amino acids are a better solution for you and are a better fix. Um, but for, for this particular scenario, people who aren't fasting, um, I think BCAAs are fine. Now, I want to address a new study that came up out of Philip Atherton's lab. And um, this was actually looking at something I directly examined in graduate school. And this was the refractory phenomenon of muscle protein synthesis. So when I was in grad school, the, the, the first study we really ran um, in my lab was looking, sorry, not my lab, but Dr. Don Lehman's lab, the lab I was doing my PhD in. Uh, the first study we really ran was looking at how long does the anabolic effect of a meal last? And what we found was that the anabolic effect lasts around three hours with a peak of muscle protein synthesis around 90 minutes. So it goes up, peaks at 90 minutes, comes back down to baseline. It's almost a nice smooth curve. But what was really interesting is that even after 90 minutes, or I'm sorry, even after 180 minutes, three hours, uh, leucine levels and branched amino acid le levels were still elevated. Intramuscular levels of leucine were still elevated. And uh, all the uh, translation factors like mTOR, 4-EBP1, P70S6 kinase, all these kinases involved in anabolism or initiating muscle protein synthesis were still very active. They were still elevated above baseline. So the question became for us, why are these, these factors that, are, that should be directing muscle protein synthesis, why is muscle protein synthesis becoming refractory to them? Uh, it's also called uh, the muscle full effect. And we started looking for different reasons. We, we looked at, like I said, intramuscular leucine, plasma leucine, plasma levels of the other amino acids. We thought perhaps they were getting depleted and maybe that was short circuiting muscle protein synthesis, but that wasn't happening. And what we noticed was uh, that over time, after triggering muscle protein synthesis, you get an increase in activity of a kinase called AMP kinase. And AMP kinase uh, is a energy sensor of the cell. And protein synthesis is a very energetically demanding process. And so we thought, okay, we're noticing this, increase, this effect on AMP kinase. Perhaps this is an energy driven issue. Maybe muscle protein synthesis is powerful enough that once it's initiated, that over time you get a reduction in cellular levels of ATP and you're unable to keep the process of muscle protein synthesis going because you don't have enough energy to do it. So we looked at that and found that in fact, um, corresponding with the decrease in muscle protein synthesis was a, a decrease in cellular levels of ATP. Now I want to emphasize that this study was in rats. Um, and so rats are typically a very, very good model for muscle protein synthesis. Um, and we actually decided that, okay, if it is an ATP issue, if we give at about like 90 minutes post meal, if we gave either leucine or carbohydrate even, because carbohydrate provides uh, uh, it would be an ATP source, we should see muscle protein synthesis continue. And that's exactly what we found. We fed a meal to, to rats, then at 90 minutes, gavage them with either carbohydrate leucine or carbohydrate plus leucine. And we found that all three were able to extend the duration of muscle protein synthesis and overcome this refractory effect. So this led me to, now obviously you can do a carbohydrate alone, but you need, you need an equivalent of about 50 grams of carbohydrate, of simple carbohydrate, at least based on our research. But you'd only need about four to five grams of BCAAs. And so I told people, you know, if you have the money to spend on BCAs, I think they're a better bang for your caloric buck. And I recommended that people consume them between meals. Um, I, w I said, you know, consume a little bit less frequent meals and consume branch chains between meals. So usually I was recommending meals every four to five hours with branch chains in between. Well, a new study from Philip Atherton's lab, they basically repeated my research in humans and did not find the same thing. Uh, they found that even though they gave, um, uh, uh, well, they, they so the, a few differences, they, they did not feed a meal like we did. Uh, they gave essential amino acids. And then at 90 minutes gave uh, leucine. 
and they found that muscle protein synthesis was not extended by giving leucine at, at 90 minutes. So the question obviously becomes, um, you know, why the difference in, in the studies? And, you know, a lot of people, this is where they get frustrated and they say things like, I don't trust science because one says one and one thing says the other thing. Well, you have to look at the study design. The first thing is, obviously, theirs was in humans, ours was in rats. But I think even more important to that, theirs was in uh, elderly humans. And if you look at, a, I'm kind of going across species here. Well, the cool thing is, they did validate that the refractory phenomenon exists. So we are in agreement there, that the refractory phenomenon exists, which is cool. That's awesome that like that thing that we, we observed um, was still there. But in, for example, in neonatal pigs, there was an experiment uh, where they looked at the muscle full effect or the refractory phenomenon and found that it really didn't happen. Um, and then in adult rats, we found that it did happen, but you could overcome it with leucine. But then these subjects were elderly. So they were elderly humans. We know a few things about elderly humans. And one of those is, is that they are more resistant to the anabolic effects of amino acids than other people. Uh, they tend to have lower stimulation of mTOR. Uh, I think they even have a lower uh, protein content of mTOR. Um, and so it is possible that if we had adult humans, and this is what I would like to see next, I would love to see this sub uh, the study repeated in adult humans and see if they find the same things. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it is a big difference, the fact that... Um, it, ours was in adult rats, theirs was in elderly humans, 75 years plus. Again, you know, uh, rats also have inherently higher rates of muscle, baseline muscle protein synthesis. That's another difference. Um, so I think you can kind of look at study design and start to see some of the differences and why they might exist. Rats are typically a very, very good model of muscle protein synthesis. And most of the research we found in our lab had been validated in humans. Um, this was the first study that I've seen, um, unless somebody can wear me of another, where we did not see um, kind of a, a, a validation of, of things we observed. So, but I'm not so sure it's as much of a species difference as it is an age difference. Because like I said, in young animals or in neonatal pigs for sp specifically, study done at Baylor, um, they showed that as long as you provided amino acid substrate, muscle protein synthesis would stay elevated and there was no refractory phenomenon. Then you step up a little bit later down the road to adults um, where maybe they're becoming a little bit more resistant to the anabolic effects of amino acids and you see this refractory phenomenon, but you're still able to overcome it. But by the time you become elderly, that refractory or muscle full phenomenon persists and you can't overcome it by providing supplemental leucine or at least not at the dosage that they provided. So I think what this certainly does is we need to revisit uh, branched amino acids. I don't feel comfortable saying they're a muscle builder anymore. Uh, I look at them as more of a recovery agent. Um, I think that they can maybe help jumpstart recovery, uh, get muscle protein synthesis back up a little bit faster. Uh, they also, uh, per calorie or a very uh, inexpensive anabolic uh, source, and so they also, um, there's some good research to suggest that they really help attenuate delayed onset muscle soreness and improve uh, rate of recovery. So I look at them more of as a recovery agent than anything. Uh, one other thing it is worth noting uh, in, the, in the study um, that Atherton did was that they did not see a uh, depletion of ATP in these people's uh, muscle cells. Which was interesting, um, it could, I'm not sure quite what it means. It could mean that um, elderly humans are not so dependent on energy to, to drive things. Um, it, it could, now interestingly, they did see an activation of EEF2, um, which is an elongation factor. Um, they saw an increase in phosphorylation of it. And when um, there's an increase in phosphorylation of EEF2, what you see is a reduction in the rate of muscle protein synthesis because it blocks the translocation of ribosomes. So I'm not exactly sure what that means. EEF2 tends to be very sensitive to uh, uh, energy levels in the cell. Um, 
So, but we didn't see a, a change in energy levels. So I think this is one of those studies where it raises more questions than it answers. And it certainly does, um, I think I'm gonna have to revisit my stance on BCAAs as new research comes out, which I, which I always do. Um, but I would not feel comfortable saying they're a muscle builder at this time. I, I still feel comfortable saying recovery agent or recovery assistant. Um, but I think we need uh, some adult human studies to really say one way or the other whether they're gonna have value in terms of um, one, uh, increasing muscle protein synthesis long term, and two, uh, can they help overcome this muscle full effect or uh, refractory phenomenon? And those are the things we don't know right now. So as of now, are they worth it? Are they a waste of money? Uh, my personal opinion, not a waste of money. It just depends on how much money you have to devote towards that, right? Like if you're having trouble paying your rent, I would not suggest you go out and buy branched amino acids. I'm also you know, not gonna tell you that you need them to make progress. You certainly don't need them to make progress. Um, do I think that they could be slightly beneficial uh, for people who are training really hard and need extra recovery assistance? Um, yeah, I think so, especially for people who are in a caloric deficit and maybe the recovery is already impaired and you're giving this kind of really potent bang for your caloric buck uh, in branched amino acids. But do we need to be taking them between meals as I've previously suggested? Well, certainly don't need it. Uh, is it helpful? I think it's hard to say at this point. Um, I think I guess I would err on the side of no more than yes, simply because we have a human study even though it was elderly and my gut feeling is you might see something different in adult um, I think right now I have to lean that way. I still will personally keep taking them um, just because, uh, you know, I, I'm, it is not cost prohibitive for me and I like to make sure I'm doing every little single thing I can to maximize my recovery, especially with the amount of training volume I do. But if you don't want to use them, that's fine. And um, I think the point here is priorities. Nutrition and training, way more important than supplements. Way more important than supplements. Um, and I see so many people get caught up in this supplement or that supplement or this supplement or that supplement, and they don't even have their nutrition and training consistent. So my advice to you, focus on getting your nutrition and training locked down. Make sure you're visiting my website, um, checking out the, the information we have on there, uh, other great resources like Mass and uh, examine.com. And I'll provide links to all those in the description, as well as some of the links to some of the studies I discussed here. That's it for now, guys. And the next time I hear anything about this research, I'll make sure you guys are the first ones to hear about it from me. Catch you later.